Well, I'm here today with Larry Wheels. We haven't talked in a few years, so this is going to be interesting catching up. And you know, I really appreciate you coming on and hope all has been well with you. So I got to start out, though. Like, I saw the 925, 420 kilo deadlift. When did yeah. you pull that? Was that just like the other day? No. So um, what I do when, first of all, what's going on, guys? And good seeing you again, Pete. It's been, uh, it's been a long time, long overdue. I'm good to see that you're in good health. And I respect your decision to come off PDs and take the natural approach. Um, I mean, for longevity, that's ultimately what I want to implement myself as well in the near future. Um, but back to your question about the deadlift. Uh, so what I do when I'm like early in a meet prep, so I have a comp in August for strongman. And one of the main lifts is uh, the first The first event is a max deadlift. That's the first event. Um, like I'm not lifting very heavy now. So I'll post throwback videos. And that, that was from... Roughly one year ago, roughly one year ago. Yeah, that's when I did that pull. Oh, wow. Yeah. During that cycle, I got up to 430 with a really ugly hitch. But it's okay and strong, man. As long as you lock it out, like, it's all good. So my goals for this particular meet, this uh, this comp is like 455, what my coach wants me to do. So <laughs> it's a bit optimistic, but we'll see. So 455, yeah. what is that? Roughly 1,000 and... 10 or something what does that come out to exactly yeah like a thousand and two or like right over a thousand pounds with a suit though i'll be using the deadlift suit that's that's crazy so is that part of like the the deadlifts world championships or what no so it's actually middle east strongest man um i have done two strongman comps before uh before the pandemic i did uh one full strongman comp in la and then i did one that was log press championship and then I was supposed to do another full one at Giants Live, which is going to be a really big event, um, like 5,000 people and such watching live. But I tore my bicep right before that, literally like the week of uh, doing Atlas Stones in the cold, rainy weather. So ever since then, I've been turned off from the sport. I'm like, ah, I don't know if I want to keep pursuing this. It's like I don't, I don't feel good about you know, um, getting injured you know, every year. And, like, this was a major injury for me. This is my first major injury that I couldn't make a full recovery from because – the tendon tore from the muscle, so they couldn't reattach it. So it's my first real major injury. Uh, and I was like, this is just the beginning <laughs> if I want to go full throttle and strong, man. But with that said, after thinking about it the last few years, I'm like, you know what, let me give it a try, you know, see how far I can get in strong, man. Yeah, I feel like like injuries are just a part of the game in strong, man. That's one of the things. No one's going to avoid injuries if they're pushing it to that level in strong, man. And bicep tears are, like, the most common. So Yeah, it's like they I pop my chair when I throw my bicep and it's so common it is. <laughs> yep. Exactly. So what's your favorite, like, of the Strongman events? Because obviously there's a million different events. You've done log press. I mean, even things as simple as, like, deadlift, Alice Stones, all that. What's what's your favorite out of all those? Hmm. I want to say uh, it's a tough one that there's so many different events. I think deadlift is king of lifts. You know, I think deadlift is like you this, but you had to pick one movement that you can do for the rest of your life and nothing else, like it would be deadlifts. It'll just work your full body. Um, you can lift the most weight with it out of any other combat movement. So and it's the most satisfying way to deadlift PR. Uh, so I want to say between the deadlift <coughs> and and the yoke, because uh, the yoke, you get to put, you know, over a thousand pounds on your back and run with it practically. And uh, I think it's a cool combination of like strength and athleticism. Because you have to like time your strides and you have to move quite quickly with a lot of weight on your back and you're always going head to head with somebody else. And I find that really cool. Um, but uh, the loading events are cool too. Like when they do like the sandbag pick up and carry, and you're running back and forth, sprinting against them, someone else. Like I like a lot of, uh, I like strong one because a lot of it is like head to head. It's like a race, you know? It's like a really cool combination of like strength and athleticism. Yeah, the tough thing, too, with strongman is, like, you're one of the lighter guys. So, you know, a lot of those guys are 150 kilos plus, 331 pounds, and it's tougher for someone like you because you're super lean, you're lighter, you're not, like, how tall are you, 6'2"? Yeah, 6'1 on a good day. We, we can round up, that's cool. But, six, like, a lot of these guys are 6'5", you know, though? It's like, it's true. so they, they just have the size advantage, which gives them better leverages. 100%. And, but, you know... When I think of that, I think about what I've accomplished in powerlifting. I've always been the lighter guy lifting more than the bigger ones. Um, and that's uh, because I've had 
I've been really lucky with my genetic makeup. I really I do leverages for squat bench and deadlift. I've always had a nice balance ball three. Um, and what really motivated me as of late to get back into Sharman and give it a try is that now that Thor and Eddie are no longer competing, right? Um, that has kind of leveled the playing field for everybody else because the Giants are kind of out. Brian Shaw's not in it. Thor's not in it. Eddie's not in it. I mean, we have like Tom Stoltman now, right? He's like six foot eight and he's also a, a behemoth. Um, and he won most recently, you know. But besides him, you know, everyone else, you know, is like, you know, like uh, we're on a level playing field, you know. The other one who won besides Tom Stoltman uh, is Novikov. He's six foot, you know, 130 kg. You know, and he beat a lot of the Giants. I mean, I'm very close to 130 kg, I'm like 127 on most days. You know, I stick around that weight now. So um, it's very realistic that I could pull off a first place win at either WSM or WS, uh, which are the two biggest comps in Strongman. Uh, I love to play my cards right. I peak appropriately. I stay healthy because you know the the the, the thing with Strongman is like you know injuries are inevitable, right? So if you can get through a prep, you know, healthy and make it to game day uninjured and peaked appropriately. Like maybe the giant guy, maybe like Tom, for example, is injured, you know, and <laughs> uh, he's not on a hundred percent. Right. So like you have to, there's so many different factors um, that you have to account for when you're doing strongman, like also your speed and condition is really important. Uh, being a lighter guy, I'll have the advantage of that. And a lot of the uh, strongman comps like have a healthy balance of, speeding conditioning plus like one rep max compound lifts so if you can find like a place in the middle there you know you can um get a win over the bigger guys that will definitely suffer and when it comes to, like uh, speed and conditioning you know with like if you're 180 kg six foot eight you can only move but so fast you know you're definitely going to gas out fast than someone like my size or Novakov size so you know the, the the possibility is there you know no doubt i'm optimistic about it yeah, and I think one of the things, too, is, like, people have given you flack. They're like, oh, injuries and all this. It's like, what do you guys expect when you're pushing your body to that level? Like, I've been in powerlifting, and I've been see people trying to squat, bench, and, and deadlift heavy. You're going to tear stuff. It's just inevitable. And if anyone pays attention to strongmen, everybody tears stuff. Everybody. You're not, nobody gets through it on skates. So you take unfair criticism as far as that goes because you have a big audience and you're like an easy target. But, and people are just trying to get content out with that stuff. But it's kind of ridiculous because it's like, what do you guys think if you're pushing your body to your limit? What's going to happen? It's like, this is inevitable. So that's kind of one thing where I just want to say it's, it's not exactly, you know, a fair criticism. But yeah, and in that sense, like you got to respect the guys in Strongman who have such a high risk for injury. And um, <clears throat> I got into it as well because I realized that, look, just if I were to pick any sport and play at the highest level, you know, even if you were to play tennis at the highest level, for example, any sport, you know, the risk for injury is there because you're pushing by to that, on, you know, you're pushing the envelope. Um, and um, or especially like the big sports like American football and European football, like think of how many injuries these guys have to deal with. Right. So. Like all the sports at the highest level, there's, you know, you have to worry about injuries. Just like you've mentioned, you have a, I have a big platform and I'm an easy target, but I don't let that get the best of me. I've had dozens of injuries at this rate. Only one that I can't come back from, which is the bicep tear, um, but it's only affected my strength and that's um, uh, by 5%, you know, so it's nothing like that's really going to set me back all too much. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to take play my uh, – I'm happy to get into the sport full throttle as long as I'm smart with training. You know, I can keep the chance of injury to a minimum, to a minimum. Yeah. So it was like the ultimate goal to win world's strongest man? Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, win as many comps as I can. There's world's strongest man, world's ultimate strong man. There's the Arnold. The Arnold would be the most satisfying because of the atmosphere you have. So many people watching live. I mean, you know, it's like at the Arnold in Columbus. It's ridiculous. So imagine you're hitting a Della PR there, right? Like, what would be more of an adrenaline rush than that, right? So I look forward to doing that. So does Strongman pretty much have your focus for, like, the foreseeable future? That's kind of what you're going all in on right now? Yeah, 100%. Uh, and, you know, the last four weeks, which is very, very recent, I started doing um, agility training once a week for about two hours every Friday. And from week one to two to three and now four, like each week I noticed a substantial increase in my stamina and how um, high my BPM gets, how quickly it comes down, you know, how much less recovery time I need between sets. And I'm never 
trained for cardio. I never tried to push my cardiovascular endurance. So this is really cool to see that I'm actually becoming a more well-rounded athlete, getting lighter on my feet uh, as a result. And um, I actually feel like an athlete now. I would always joke about my friends and people would ask me about like uh, getting into powerlifting, how it's kind of like a lazy man sport because you have like 15 minutes rest in between sets, you know? You can damn near have snacks and gummy bears and cookies in between sets. And it's like, <laughs> it's like you don't feel like an athlete, you know, like I didn't at least. Um, I never felt like an athlete doing powerlifting. I felt really strong, though. Don't get it twisted. But I never felt like an athlete because, you know, I would struggle if I had to have a light jog or had to walk more than an hour or stand for a few hours at once. You know, like I had to deal with a lot of um, there's a lot of consequences to being that big and not well-rounded and fit, you know, like I didn't sleep well and. Um, whenever I'd have a collaboration with someone from another sport background, like bodybuilding, for example, or CrossFit, especially, um, I'd always be struggling to keep up with them because their rest periods are so much shorter. The workouts are much higher, have much higher intensity. And, um, you know, like it started, it started to get to me. Hmm, I don't feel very healthy. I don't feel very fit. You know, I, I want to change that. And, um, but I would never get on the treadmill or do the stair match, which is mind numbingly boring. Uh, so when I do this agility training for strongmen, it's really fun. I got to watch my feet doing things like the ladder or like vertical jumps and stuff. So, you know, I have to focus quite, quite intensively. And as a result, like the time flies by. So I'm getting in really good cardiovascular training and, you know, the time moving quite quick. So I can sustain this kind of training and cardio. And like I said, it's already making quite a significant difference in how, like how long it takes me to recover between sets and such. Yeah, that makes sense. And like you've done every everything there is to do like you've done bodybuilding you've done powerlifting you've done strongman you've done arm wrestling you've done all the things so i know strongman's kind of taking your focus right now and you said world's strongest man winning that is obviously a major goal is that like the ultimate goal what's the ultimate goal and out of all the strength sports everything like the most significant accomplishment you could have in your life in your opinion even if it's not in competition if there is there a pr number that would be like the ultimate goal or what do you think yeah, <clears throat> I want to say thousand pound deadlift conventional, you know, with or without a suit. That's that's the goal right there. I've always because no other lift will give me an adrenaline rush like hitting a big PR on the deadlift. Deadlift has always been the king of the lifts. I mean, when I got into lifting, I started watching you and how hyped you would get after hitting those periods with the washer dry behind you. And that's what started me off. And that's what hyped me up. And to this day, like, I mean, a 700 pound bench would be cool. A thousand pound squat would be cool, but it wouldn't get my adrenaline going like a thousand pound deadlift would. Uh, you know, winning Wuss or Arnold's or WSM, you know, that's a long, that's a, that's a big goal, you know, and it would be really satisfying to achieve that. Um, but if I had to choose just one particular specific lift, it would definitely be the deadlift. That would be the most satisfying above all, above all else. Yeah, I, I totally get that because there was a while I was chasing like 900 pounds in competition and I never quite got there. But just to be to be that close was cool. And, you know, that that is the most exciting lift, in my opinion. All the other PRs are really nice. But when you hit like a deadlift PR, there's something just so satisfying about that. Exactly. I'm on the same page as you there. Now, do you think you're ever going to like do a meet again or what do you think about powerlifting? Because you've oh, let's be honest, you've you've done everything there is to do. Like, in my opinion, you're you're accomplished it all you've climbed mount everest you've done you've done it all there's so do you think you'll like ever get back into powerlifting, or are you just going to keep it on strongman or what, what are you thinking there you know i think with powerlifting, i've achieved all my goals and at this rate for me the next goal in powerlifting would be to take the super heavyweight world world record total you know or the equip total and <laughs> uh, it, it could be done you know i if there's anyone to do it you know i definitely have a fair shot at that but the motivation isn't there, especially because I've done it for a very long time now. I've been powerlifting competitively, competitively since I've been 18, you know, up until you know, like 25, 26. And, um, like, the thrill of doing a meet isn't there anymore, you know, to be honest. Um, strongman, you know, all the movements are fresh. Um, some of them being quite innovative, like that wheel of death that Thor and all the other guys did at one of these particular events. Like, there's always these, these new creative events in Strongman that um, – some of them are randomly thrown in, so you don't even know what to expect when you do the comp. Like you just have to hope that you can adapt to the situation and overcome. Um, but that's what keeps Strongman so exciting to me because of the healthy variety. And it's just the idea of doing another squat bench deadlift meet 
you know, like the, just the thrill isn't there anymore. You know, the thrill isn't there. For the deadlift, it still is, though. For the deadlift, yes. The deadlift will always be super exciting. But for bench and squat, you know, not so much. No, I totally get that. Because even for me, like, lifting in general just isn't quite as exciting as it used to be. And, you know, a part of that is, like, my body doesn't feel like it did when I was 20, even 25. I'm 30 now, so... I've been doing it oh, since wow. I was 14. I have a lot of wear and tear and my body, like my back, you know, hurts quite often. My hips are all jacked up. Uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't perform like it used to. I don't know. Do you have any of that? Cause you've been in the game a long time. Do you feel like your body's not like where it was five, six, even, you know, longer than that, even more than that years ago? Like, do you feel any wear and tear or do you feel pretty fresh still? Frankly, I feel pretty fresh. Um, no doubt the PRs don't come as easy anymore. That's no doubt. You know, they're a lot harder. Like every 0.5% is a struggle to put on. And that's a lot of, that's part of the reason why I'm not jumping back into a meet for the foreseeable future, if not ever, because what I'll have to do to hit another squat PR, hit another bench PR, the amount of peas I need to take and the food I need to consume, you know, like it's so unhealthy that I don't want to do it to my body again. Um, now, in strongman, you know, it can be argued that you need to take even more, you know, but um, I spoke with some competitors and it's not so much about uh, pushing the envelope with that stuff as it is about like just having um, the movement down to a science and being like really efficient in your way of lifting it and all that and the other. But for me to hit PR to those specific movements, like it's going to take so much that I'm not willing to sacrifice my health anymore for that. And um and now <clears throat> I don't have any aches and pains, but that's because I'm so into soft all year round. So the access an anti-inflammatory, you know, if I were to ever come off, which I have years back and straight away, my hips hurt, my knees hurt, my elbows hurt, you know, everything like comes, <laughs> I just come back to reality. Like, okay, like this is what my body's actually going through. But when you're testosterone, I mean, you know, and you're abusing it, like you're, you feel like Superman, you know, like you don't notice your body is numb to those aches and pains that you would have if you weren't taking it. Uh, so I know if I ever come off entirely one day, even off TRT, that that's waiting for me, you know, just a matter of when. Yeah, I totally get that. I, uh, I wonder if that kind of exacerbates how I feel right now because body just feels like trash, but I've been off testosterone for almost 18 months. So obviously I've lost like tons of weight, tons of strength, and it's just part of the game. Now, like here's, here's something interesting because in strongman, I've always wondered this, because strongman is so endurance based, so cardiovascularly based. Is trend like not as big in strongman because you have to be able to like do these endurance events, and we all know trend kind of works counter counteractively against endurance. Because in powerlifting, trend is like the go to. Like I loved it; it was my number one drug. Made crazy progress on it. But I feel like if you're doing like yo carries and farmers walks, trend might like gas you out easier. So like the guys not use it as much. Well, you know, it depends on the event. So let's say there's five different movements that you have to train for. And, you know, three of them are heavy compound movements, but two of them are moving events. In that particular case, if you're confident that you can place quite high in the compound movement events, you can get away with using trend because you'll know that your overall placing across the five events, sorry, the five exercises will be, will be good, you know, but if um, you think that you're going to really dominate the moving events, then you wouldn't be best to use trend uh, because it 100% will gas you up very quickly. Even, you know, no matter how hard you put yourself on trend, you'll never have the stamina that you would if you're off of it doing the same thing, right? It's always going to be a compromise. Um, so I think strategically using the drugs that you think you'll, that you think you'll perform best at, like, uh, again, if there's three combat movement, like a, let's say there's a, a log clean and press, a deadlift, you know, and a giant dumbbell press. And then two of the movements are like yoke and farmers, right? And you think that you're going to crush all the compound movements. You can run trend and then, you know, place number one or two in those three movements. And then in the moving events, you're not going to place as well, but your overall points, your overall score will be still really good because you place high at the majority of the events, you know? So um, it depends on the lineup of uh, movements for the events for what the guys use. Um, but I've heard mega doses. You know, there's always those guys who just push it to astronomical doses, regardless of the events, you know, and, and try and get away with it. But <laughs> um, when you see guys like Novikov, you know, um, like how much could he possibly be running at 130 kg, you know, at six foot? You know, he, he, he can't be pushing it that hard. Um, so I think uh, 
just not trying to abuse it and try and like let the PDs carry you and like really focusing on like just being really movement efficient and like getting the movement down to a science and like being smart about everything. But with your programming and your peaking is more important than like just trying to um, let the drugs carry you all the way. And, you know, I try to get away with the bare minimum, you know, I try to get away with the bare minimum. But the trend has just, besides gas and the events, like all the other sides, the trend brings like the mood swings and the insomnia and the acne. Like, it's just a nightmare to deal with it. Like, is it even worth the small extra strength gain they'll give you over something like a D ball, a T ball, or, you know, or Decker Ecoport? Like, is it even worth it? But it's, it's just a nightmare to deal with. It's, uh, I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> Dude, my, my wife, like, it's, this was like four years ago. She's like banned me from it. She's like, no more trend. It makes you crazy. Cause it legit like the mind games are insane. I feel like I'm psychotic. Like I turn into crazy person, aggressive, um, paranoid, like super. It's it's so bad for me. So it got me like nothing got me as strong as that did, but I just couldn't handle it much longer. And I don't know. I, but I, I've pushed some crazy cycles, and I feel like too what you were saying. Like as we got older, as we get older, it's we kind of tone it back. We're like, okay, we got to find a balance between health and and performance. So you kind of you kind of scale back from the younger days where it's like crazy stuff. Exactly, and then when you're young, you know you can get away with it because everyone tells you, all your peers like, "Oh, you're young, don't worry about it. Like you're supposed to be healthy and everything." But you're totally right. I'm on that same page with, "Okay, I'm going to be 30 soon, and I need to dial things back, and I want to have kids, you know, soon. You know, I don't want to be 35, 40 trying to have kids. Um, I don't even know if I'm fertile enough to have kids. I have to deal with that as well. I have to figure that out." Um, so, you know, you start, you know, life hits you, you know, quick, it comes fast and there are definitely consequences to running this kind of stuff for so long. I mean, I'm on it, been on PDs for 10 years straight. Right. <clears throat> and, uh, the worst of them has definitely been trying. I mean, on all the other PDs, my mental health is okay. I'm not paranoid or I'm not, you know, irritable or aggressive, overly aggressive, you know? So it's just that one, it's just trying that just just makes life living hell you know it just makes everything everything gets to me on track so i i haven't used it in a while for that reason or orals for that matter you know i say to just test at the moment well I, I totally know what you mean like it's just there's nothing like it halo testing never made me like that halo testing maybe made me a touch more irritable but i never got the like crazy game mind games like trend and it was just it was one of those things i, I ran it upwards of uh like going into some of those meets, like the backyard meet of the century that said super training. I was doing like 700 MIGs. And like we would just get to the last two weeks before the meet and just pin everything and pretty much try to go on and, and do the best you could. But I, I, you know, the last couple of years I was competing, I was big into like Anavar. Like Anavar, I don't know if you have much experience with it. I'm sure you've tried it. I love it. Like that's my favorite, hands down. Okay. Yeah. It's my go to when I'm cruising. I just want a little boost or if I'm like a photo shoot or, uh, uh, if I if I don't have any big goals in mind, Anabar definitely fills that void. I like fifty to hundred minutes a day, and you know, just no 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 real sides to mention. Yeah. I only get my blood on it, and everything comes back okay, except for like some elevated blood pressure and you know maybe liver enzyme and such, but nothing really significant that's um, like threatening my health. Like, but if I get my blood done on trend, <laughs> oh god, yeah, every, right. everything's in the red. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad my cholesterol i think my ldl which is like your bad cholesterol i didn't check i didn't do a lot of, of uh blood work when i was on cycles like that because you don't want to see you kind of bury your head in the sand back in the day you're like i don't want to know i know it's bad i think it was like uh 185 but i've seen guys 300 plus ldls and um obviously like it's and it's part of the thing it's just you're pushing your body it's it's part of the cost but anavar i got just as good a strength as like anadrol like I, I got better actually anavar i saw better strength gains than anadrol i loved it it was like my favorite i wish i discovered it sooner but it's just it's one of those things okay huh. i'll have to try that next time i'm preparing for um for a big pr i never tried anavar in preparation for a big pr it's always been like in my bodybuilding days where i would try and cut down for a show i'd have anavar oh. in the mix yeah they, that's what i would use anavar gains are crazy like the strength gains are absurd i uh i would basically do because it takes about two to three weeks to kick in so the first two to three weeks you're not going to feel much i'll do 25 megs and then th three weeks in i'll kick it up to 50 megs 25 morning 25 evening to cover the half-life and i would run it like 12 weeks because it's not very liver toxic at all as you said your liver enzymes don't change much your your hdl which is your good cholesterol it'll get cut down in about 50 percent 
But other than that, like the actual damage on lab work isn't that bad. So obviously, like it does affect lipids a little bit. Liver enzymes are not touched hardly at all. And it's just one of those things like you can run for prolonged periods as far as what I did. And I didn't notice any negative side effects beyond what I would see on the labs. And I, the strength gains were absurd, like so explosive. It would make me so explosive. I could just, my deadlift would instantly feel much stronger, crazy explosion. Like it was hundred percent my go-to. I loved it. Uh, so, interesting. And it didn't affect your appetite negatively or nothing like no toxicity as far as that's concerned, because it's not hard on the liver. So you don't get all the toxicity. So I, I was I'm like huge on Anavar. I, you know, obviously I don't take anything anymore, but like, I loved it. That was my favorite. Awesome. I'll that's what Hack that. said too. He said, he, Hack said that's his favorite and he, uh, he'll add an Anadrol too, but he loves Anavar. Okay, then. Huh. That's good to know. Yeah. When I prepare for my comp, I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try. I just like it. Cause you can, you can run it. Like you don't, it's not like uh it's not like regular orals where it's like, okay, four or five weeks and you're off. It's like, you can kind of run it for long periods without all the damage now you know it's 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 just not as aggressive as other things and it gives you crazy explosive power from what i've noticed so yeah yeah because that explosive pop only ever felt from trend and hand roll nothing else gave me that explosivity like that uh, the only thing that ever gave me that except for anavar was trend trend and and maybe super gel but super gel is very toxic you feel like crap uh, it's it's but anavar i got that explosive power what yeah, if, that, if there's anything worse than trend, totally super gross. For hormones in general. I don't know what they put in that, but if there's anything worse than trend, that's definitely it. Just makes you feel lethargic. Yeah. Yeah, where's the fun in that? <laughs> well, the other thing too, like I was telling John, um, there was like when I pulled, when I did the 2100 total, which was my best total, I know obviously you've done quite a bit more. It was like before deadlifts, I took check drops and I loved that. That was pretty fun. But that's super toxic. Like I did it like once and that's it, you know. Yeah, I remember. I think it was maybe it was record breakers when they were giving it out. <laughs> Someone was giving it out, check drops, and I tried one. Do you remember people? Everybody was going in the bathroom, like pinning suspension before the, the meet. <laughs> that was totally me. Yep, I was in the bathroom yeah. with suspension. Right, every single meet, just about. Everybody, everybody was, was, though. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, <laughs> that is indeed true. Yeah, I thought I was the only one. <laughs> no dude i remember it was like a revolving door at record breakers because everyone would go in pin their suspension come out and squat it was like that all day <laughs> uh, those are the good days yeah yeah dude it seems like now. so long ago bro we were doing that what was that like seven years ago oh god yeah it, it was so long ago the different lifetime it feels like that's when you were a 242 yeah that's that is indeed true I would uh, bulk it's like uh, what, maybe 255 and cut down to 242. Yep, that's about right. Yeah. Long time ago. So yeah. I got to ask too, like, okay, so you lived, you, where'd you, where, what was the island you grew up in? It was uh, St. Martin, and I lived there for about two and a half years between 14 and uh, 16. And then I came back to the U.S., got my GD. Uh, then uh, from 17, and onward, that's when I started powerlifting. Yeah, 17, that's why I really got into it. You grew up in New York, right? I grew up in New York, and I only left back uh, pre-pandemic. I left in late 2018 to go to L.A. I was there three, four months, and that seemed like to be the hub for being a fitness influencer at the time. Um, is it still? I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know, but the homeless problem seems to be horrendous, so... I don't know where that hub might be now. I want to say it could be Dubai, at least for internationals. Um, so, you know, back to L.A., I was there for three months. Then I moved to J uh, Iceland in January. And then in uh, March, I moved to Dubai for an opportunity here to learn strongman from a recognized coach. And it was uh, all-inclusive, everything paid for, six-week trip at a five-star hotel. I was like, yeah, hell yeah. And at the time, you know, Dubai was like Narnia to me, you know, coming from uh, like, I had never really traveled much before this, you know, before Dubai. I've been to, like, uh, like London, Paris, Italy, and, uh, like, China and Tokyo. Um, but those are all, like, really short trips. Uh, so Dubai seemed, like, so foreign to me. And I was like, yeah, hell yeah. And then once I got here, I looked back at L.A. Like, I just got in a lease on my apartment as well. And I canceled the lease straight away, you know, paid the termination fee. Like, okay, you know, we're just staying in Dubai. It made so much sense because we had intended 
on doing traveling every single month, going to everywhere, making clouds with everyone. And it ended up being that we went nowhere due to the pandemic. <laughs> so we were lucky enough um, <laughs> that everyone was coming to us because Dubai was one of the only countries that, you know, there was no real strict COVID restriction. So a lot of foreigners can come here to Dubai and use it actually as like a haven because they maybe were in lockdown in their own country. Because we were one of the first countries to go into lockdown and also come out of lockdown. And, you know, this went on for a long time. And um, that's actually what I've made some of the most significant gains on our YouTube channel uh, during the pandemic because we're doing, you know, so many collabs. Like, in, uh, and if, like, we had stayed in L.A., all the gyms were closed, I think, except for Zoo Culture, you know. So what it would have been like for collabs and growing the channel during the pandemic if we were to stay in L.A., I don't know. But I know that going to Dubai, and even to today, to this day onward, is a really good decision for growing my channel. Hence why we're still here. What's your favorite things about Dubai? Like, obviously, I, I'm sure you like the weather and all that. Maybe it's too hot, though. I don't know. But what are your favorite things oh, about it? I mean, dude, it's super hot. It's like 100 degrees plus 80% humidity day in and day out here. And it's not even summer yet. It gets even worse in the summer, like a buck 20 to 30 every day. 100% humidity, but it doesn't rain. It's never cloudy. There's no change of season or weather. I'm really selling, aren't I? The winters are incredible. The winters are like, they're like there's nothing better than Dubai winter in the world. I think Dubai winter is the best place to be. Um, but what I love most about it, <clears throat> and I tell everyone this, is how safe and how clean it is. Coming from New York, New York is filthy. You know, there's garbage in the streets. There's, you know, there's homeless everywhere, but the subway at least. And it's stinky for the most part. It's, it's congested. You know, it's really unsafe. You have that feeling that you always need to look over your shoulder in New York, right? Like, who's walking behind you? Who's around you? You have to be quite observant and on your and, and on your toes in New York. Um, and in Dubai, you never have to deal with that. I mean, it, you can leave your phone anywhere. No one will take it. You know, there's no garbage in the street. There's no smell. It's just like a bubble. You know, it's just really safe and really clean here. If there's anywhere I want to raise children, it would definitely be Dubai. You know, I'd feel safe if they were to walk to school and back alone kind of a thing. You know, I live in um, I live in a villa now in a nice, uh, nice neighborhood full of young families. And growing up in New York, I always lived in apartments. And I never thought I'd live in a, in a home, in a house, because I was like, in the U.S., it just seems so unsafe to be in a house because anyone can enter your house they can easily break into the window or the balcony door for example and, or they can you know see when you leave when you come and go it's just it always seems so unsafe to live in a home in the u.s versus an apartment because i'm like who's going to break into my apartment in, in in new york or la for example um but in dubai i don't think about these things you know i, I can leave my door unlocked i lock it though in case you know where i live i do lock my door i can leave you know my windows on open for example and come and leave come and go and like everything's gonna be where i left it i don't have to worry about anyone breaking in and murdering me it just it's like that kind of safety you know and that makes me feel really comfortable here uh and i never had that feeling anywhere else i've lived granted that's only been new york and la and la very briefly uh but um, this is the kind of place where you can really settle down and you can raise kids. You know, this is the kind of vibe that, that it gives. Wow. Okay. I feel like, I feel like you feel, I feel like you feel like LA sucks too. Was it pretty bad or what was it like? It was, dude. I mean, look, I mean, coming from New York, everyone kind of has like a chip on their shoulder. Everyone's in a rush. LA, the one thing I like most about it was it was not like that at all. The overall attitude I felt in LA was people seem to be happier in general, more polite. Uh, more friendly, you know, um, you can ask a stranger what time is and once they go fuck yourself. So it was like, <laughs> like in that, in that respect, LA was really cool. You know, the overall attitude was, was nice. Uh, but besides that traffic was really frustrating. I chose to live in downtown LA, my mistake. Uh, and I would go to uh, zoo culture, which was in Woodland Hills. And that was like an hour and a half, not because it was long, i uh, sorry, a long drive, a far drive, but because it was in standstill traffic the whole way there and the whole way back. And, you know, that really put me off. Like, I live, I can get to the gym now in 10 minutes where I'm at in Dubai. Like, it's just ultra convenient. And um, if I lived in Woodland Hills next to Zoo Culture, that could be the same case. But, you know, I'm not growing up there. I didn't know where to move. So I just moved into what was familiar, which was living in an apartment in, like, the big city part of L.A., which was downtown L.A. Um, but the homeless, I mean, I lived super close to Skid Row in downtown. Uh, so I would drive by that every day. 
Uh, and it's really depressing to see that. And, you know, in New York, we have shelters. You know, they have plenty of places to go for hot food and everything. So they're not exactly taken care of, but they have options for, like, having a roof over the head, a bed to stay at night, food, hot food when they need it, provided that they show up on time. But in L.A., they're just, like, in the street, in tents, you know, everywhere. And this was pre-pandemic. Post-pandemic, like, now it's, I hear it's so much worse. Everyone who's been from Dubai that I know has, who's been to LA recently, you know, says it's terrible there and that the homeless have like invaded Venice and Santa Monica. And like, it's really unsafe. And it's like the last place I really want to be right now. Um, and there's like a mass migration to Texas, like, which I would probably move. If I was moving back to US, it would be Texas. I'd pick uh, probably Houston or Dallas, one of the cities and move like in the suburbs. That's probably where I would be if I were to go to the U.S. I would definitely never move back to L.A. We'll never say never, but it would be unlikely from what I've been hearing. Yeah, that's crazy. What about other parts of California? Because, like, there's the Bay Area, but it's kind of cold. And then San Diego, I've never – I've been to the airport. I heard it's kind of nice. And then what you were saying, too, with Texas, like, that's where a lot of people are, too. A lot of guys like Russ, Russell Ori, Ashton's down there. I think a ton of guys. Uh, Johnny Candido, a lot of guys are down there. Yeah, I mean, just for cost of living, like, you can't beat Texas, man. Texas, oh, man, your dollar goes a long way. Like, bang for buck, I mean, Texas, I mean, considering as well, like, how close you are to the big cities, you're in the middle of America, so only three hours to go either east to west, like, near LA, if you have any big collabs or, or anything going on. Uh, so I think that would be a smart decision um, uh, if you are, you know, looking to make your money stretch. Now, I much prefer the scenery and the weather, and California in general, like even like San Diego, San Francisco, I've been both. And it's full of suburbs, which I like now that I'm living in a suburb. Uh, but the cost of living, man, it's like, it's insane. You know, I mean, a million dollar home and you get like a two bedroom, like maybe like a thousand square feet home. You know, your money does not stretch at all. So, you know, that, I mean, if I really, really make it and I would consider, you know, San Diego, San Francisco, but at the moment, like it's just too much. I'd much rather let my dollar go a long way, go to Texas for that same million bucks where you get a small home in San Diego, San Francisco, you get a mansion in like Waco, Texas, for example, you know, you could be living so much nicer, you know, not to mention the taxes are significantly lower. And um, yeah, man. so I think Texas would be the place to be unless you're like loaded. Well, do you or you're working. Oh, you sorry. Think? Or as you going to say, unless like, um, work requires you to be in san diego san francisco uh but you know as of what i do now i can move just about anywhere that has a good gym so i would choose texas uh, well do you ever think you'll like move back to the states or are you pretty uh planted in dubai you know well i'll go with the opportunity is you know I, I chased money to be honest uh so as of now there's still opportunity in dubai but that may change uh everything changes inevitably so if that does change and it happens to be in the U.S., for sure, I would go back to the U.S., right? Um, and there's no real incentive with taxes being a U.S. citizen in Dubai because you still have to pay the same federal income tax as if you're living in the U.S., which is utter crap. So <laughs> people can't, be, and if you're from the U.S., you can't move here and live tax-free, which sucks because I'm surrounded by people from the U.K. and Europe who move here and live tax-free a hundred percent like you motherfuckers so yeah yeah i don't get that benefit and you wouldn't either anyone else listening from the u.s if you move here for that reason don't do it like because you're not off the hook they give you like um up to a certain amount of money like about 100k um tax-free but if you're earning excess of that of course um then you get taxed the same income tax as if you were living in the u.s so yeah um but it would be Texas. I would move back, and it, it would be Texas. But like I said, I go over what the opportunity is. That's well, why I'm uh, Dubai is like a central location too, as far as the world. Like it's really right in the middle, so that kind of helps. Um, now, what's your what's your favorite place you've ever traveled? Because you've been to a few different countries. Obviously, you've been to um, different states. Like it could be states, country. What, what's your favorite place personally? Where you're like, I love it here. I love going here. I mean, look, <laughs> if I were to live anywhere. It would be Bel Air. I mean, I think if money was no object, unlimited funds, totally Bel Air. I've been to some really nice homes in Bel Air. I mean, just get yeah, the crazy view of all the mountains. It's so green and it's just like a fairy tale living, you know. Um, but besides where I'd live, the place that I visited most, 
that's been most fun would be Tokyo. Um, wow. It's like Japanese New York, you know, and it's just so congested, so crowded. It feels like home. There's a lot of familiarity, familiarity there. So maybe that's why I like it so much. Because it feels a lot like New York with how congested everything is and on top of each other everything is. Uh, but the food everywhere I went was so good. And um, it was just the fashion was so different from what I've ever seen. It's just like a different world, you know, but also familiar at the same time. Um, I really enjoyed my time there. Yeah. I think I think Tokyo is pretty safe, too, from what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've heard the same. And it's supposed to be a, quite a livable city. And if you were to buy a home there, like, they're averaging around like 300 grand for like new modern homes in Tokyo, US dollars, which is, you know, affordable for just for anyone. So, like, you can, uh, it's not advised. I've watched some videos of uh, Japanese bloggers from Tokyo uh, <clears throat> on their opinion about like if Americans or foreigners move to Tokyo, it's not a good idea. But, um, like, the people there, they, they get taken care of by the government, they have a lot of opportunity. And, uh, yeah, I've read that it's pretty safe. I mean, I've only spent like a week there. So, but I, I felt safe while I was there, you know. Yeah, it seems like a it seems like a safe place to be. Yeah, I know it too. It's the biggest population for any city in the entire world, like the biggest. So that's kind of crazy. It like it. Oh yeah, it, it should be a crop uh, dude. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's just it, the congestion. Like- is it? Is it? So which is more congested? Because you've been to like India, you've been to uh, you've been to you know New York City, and you've been to Tokyo. Like, what's the most congested area? You think? I'd have to say India, because no matter where you go in India, even the countryside is just just too congested. It's like packed like sardines. I mean, there's traffic utterly everywhere. Um, it's just it's just too much. Uh, Tokyo, I never felt like it was too congested. Um, and New York, I mean, only in certain pockets of the city does it ever really feel like that, like in Times Square, for example, or like Dumbo and Brooklyn, like the, Um, or downtown Brooklyn, like those areas can feel really congested. Um, But there's a lot of places in New York City that, you know, are like suburb, suburb suburb-like that are not really congested. Uh, You know, there's empty streets and uh, the atmosphere is a lot more chill than if you were going to those really dense pockets of of the city. Um, But in Tokyo, it felt more congested overall than New York because I went to a lot of Tokyo and everywhere I went was just, it was ridiculous. Like, you know, there'd be one shop, you know, and then there'd be 10 shops on top of that shop, like in a vertical format. It was just like ridiculous, like stuff like that. Like it was, <laughs> it was really everything just packed on top of each other. Like you could not believe. So, and there was no empty streets anywhere. Every street was like hustling and bustling, like everywhere I went, like there was no uh, peace and quiet there at all, you know? So yeah, Tokyo felt even more congested. So Adam, the, Top three would be like number two, with India being um, number one for sure. Now you've lived such a crazy life. Like you're living, you know, you're traveling, you're living out your dream, and all that. Did you ever think you'd be in this position when you were a kid or you were younger, or like even you know when you got that animal sponsorship and you were starting out? Like, did you picture yourself at this point, or did this has this been a whirlwind? Has it just been like I can't believe I've I've gotten to this point? And you know, what what do you think? Uh, look, man, I mean, when I first got the animal sponsorship, um, I had the sense that I was onto something there. I didn't know what exactly or where it was going to take me. I mean, it wasn't even a salary. It was just some free subs. But, you know, at the time, it felt like, wow, my life is changing. Because at that time, I had no passion for anything else besides lifting. So I didn't see where I could be in 5, 10, 20 years from now, right? Like, I was actually in school for criminal justice just because of the benefits, because of the decent salary, because my best friend who now passed, RBBTC, he, you know, was a a police officer and he would talk about the benefits and his salary and his, you know, like the the, the privileges that he had as um, in his position. Um, But it wasn't what I really wanted to do. It was just something to do to pay the bills and have security. And, you know, if I want to raise a family, I got to have like a, you know, a nice job and a good retirement plan. And like, you know, just I was uh, on track to doing what I thought was the right thing to do, not what I wanted, what I love to do, you know? So um, I got lucky in the sense where I met the right people with the first of them who changed my life, John Gaglione. Like that started off with training programs, you know? And once those training programs started selling, like I quit my job as a personal trainer. I was serving tables as well. I was, you know, working odd in job nine to five. 
um, not making much money, living with my mom. And then I started selling these training programs. And from day one, I remember me like 600 bucks, like, whoa, like that's a lot of money for me. You know, like shit, like I could, <laughs> I could live off of this. And it just kept increasing and it just kept going and going and going. It was consistent. And uh, then, you know, I met um, some people in LA who taught me how to sell merchandise and, you know, about like a membership site and this and the other. And then like, it's all been meeting the right people, to be honest, that helped me get ahead. Um, because me as an individual, um, my vision has never been that great, to be honest. You know, I never saw myself as like changing the industry or being like the best of anything. Um, I just wanted to lift heavy weight, you know, and like, and, and smash some big PRs, right? I never had huge goals like this or big vision. Uh, so, you know, by just being a nice guy, being humble, I've been lucky enough to have these people in my life that help steer me in the right direction so I can take good care of myself and the people I love. Yeah, I feel like that's something I was saying a week ago. I'm like, it's not, we all get help in life. Like, it's the people we meet, the opportunities we get presented. Like, it's it's networking in a sense. And that's that's what gets us to where we are. Like, we can't ever do it alone. That's what I've learned. We always have help. All these people we meet, they have an impact on our lives in some some degree. And that that's kind of what sets you down the right path. So it's, it's something I, I try to remember because it's like, you don't do this alone. You got a, tons of help along the way. People showing you different things. So exactly like one hand washes the other you know so i always make an effort to just treat everyone equally you know treat them with kindness and hopefully one day it's returned to me do you think you'll ever like kind of retire get out of the scene like kind of you know live a quiet life will you be like okay i made it i've done everything i want to do you know maybe 10 years from now and just kind of uh enjoy life or do you think you'll always kind of be in the spotlight and trying to do something is that is that what drives you well, at the moment, I'm actually learning day trading, like uh, trading, uh, forex trading and such. I have a mentor now. And, you know, that's like step one of making my exit from the spotlight because no one can stay in the spotlight forever. Yes. Um, and in fitness, at least, um, I don't have dreams and vision of becoming like some A-list celebrity, like an actor or so on and so forth. I'm not in the place to do that anyways i'm in dubai if i was in la that was one of my goals was to get into acting and you know um following the footsteps of people like the rock for example and you know slowly make my exit from the fitness scene and go into something bigger and more lucrative um but day training at the moment can be exactly that you know where i don't have to be in the spotlight or rely on social media or smash huge prs or you know be larry wheels i could completely sustain my lifestyle if not better it and not have to take peds you know or put my body into this kind of stress so that's definitely the the long-term goal i'm learning i'm in the process um, my mentor you know he used to be a waiter and now he's a multimillionaire and he's 25 so like it can 100 percent happen that granted that i'm willing to you know take the time to learn and practice and be smart with my money that i make from it as well uh so that's like i've been keeping quiet about it because i'm just starting my journey in it but that is like step one into like exiting the spotlight while I'm still ahead. Cause I don't want to do this, you know, when I'm washed up, you know, like I'm riddled with injuries and, you know, no one cares about Larry Wills anymore. And then like, okay, shit, what do I do now? So like, I'm trying to be ahead of that because it, like, inevitably it's going to come. I want to make a graceful exit from the scene. You know what I mean? I may be involved um, some way or the other, uh, but it won't be as an athlete, of course. Like when I'm 35, I don't want to still try, be trying to smash PRs in the gym, you know, because uh, my bike only takes so much. And um, I see myself living a long life and, you know, um, you know, running around with my kids, being healthy, out of a wheelchair, hopefully. <laughs> so, you know, like I have, uh, like I'm getting older and I have to take things more seriously. So that's that's where I see myself in the next, you know, few years, like exiting the spotlight gracefully, learning another craft as I'm beginning now and being in the, in the, in the scene, maybe as like a host or, you know, uh, I don't know what that might be, but I'm sure I'll, like, I'll always be into fitness and strength sports and feats of strength. So whichever way I can be involved in it without having to be an athlete, I'll, I'll do my best to do that. Yeah. I think this is so refreshing to hear. And like, well, I'm on the same page with you because I had this great fear for a long time. I'm like, if I'm not hitting PRs, am I relevant? Does anybody care? And it was a struggle I went through for years because the, the, I haven't hit PRs really since I was 26. It's been four years. And it's kind of funny now because I'm not really competing. I'm not on PEDs. I'm not like pushing heavy weight. And things are like taking off more than ever. 
not having to rely on that strength. And it's so refreshing because I thought no one would care. And I would just be a nobody if I wasn't like hitting PRs and wasn't because you know how it is. You're only as relevant as your last PRs, the latest, like that's all people care about. Cause there's always people who come along and improve. So I was really scared. Like if I'm not at the top of my game, what am I going to, you know, is anyone going to care anymore? And it's been so cool to see, like, it's the opposite. Like you can kind of pivot and go a different direction, get out of things as far as what you have to do personally. And people are even more interested. So, so it's just been, that's been cool to see with like my channel, it's blowing up and I'm not even having to like do what I used to do and put my body through that stress. Cause people respect you, Larry, like you have the credibility, you've done everything. You're, you're the most well-known guy. Like you're at the top of the game. So you, you won't have to rely on that for even like, even if you didn't want to now, if you were like, I'm, I'm good, I've, I've accomplished everything I want to do. And I know you're not there yet, but even if you were there now, you would be fine. I promise you. Like it was my biggest fear and I'm, I'm doing okay. And I think you'd be even more of an example of that. So don't feel like you have to just like do it forever and be like, oh man, otherwise I have no credibility because you have all the credibility. So. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. And like, you're a living testament to exactly what I fear as well. I fear the same thing. You know, like, what will I do if I can't do PRs? And, you know, um, the people in my circle, you know, for the most part, um, uh, Adam, the man behind the camera, he sees that as like, you know, like you have to hit these periods, Larry, like otherwise you're going to get views or this and the other. But I'm trying to think bigger than that. You know, I'm trying to think of like worst case scenario. But as you said, like it helps you pivot off your other skills and it forces you to come out of your shell and, you know, learn new crafts and become better at other things. Like if you're not focused on hitting periods anymore, then you have inevitably to focus on something else. Right. And that's exactly what you've done. Now your channel is growing as a result. So it's definitely motivation for me. Like you seeing you here today, off PDs for, you know, nearly two years now, your channel's blowing up, you know, and you found a way to, you know, grow and sustain your lifestyle without having to do that or put your body in immense stress. And that's where I want to be, you know, hundred percent. Yeah. Just don't ever feel like PRs are what like make people follow you. Cause it's not, I, I realized that I didn't know that, but I realized like the PRs, that's not why people are here watching your content or keeping up with you. So you know, if you ever have like a stretch where you're like, okay, I'm not, I'm not doing so well or anything. You feel that pressure. I've felt that pressure where I start freaking out and I want to, I'm like, I need relevant content. I need to hit PRs for Instagram. And, um, it's just so refreshing when the realization actually hits where you're like, I don't need to do that. I don't need to be that guy. Like for you, you don't need to be Larry wheels. You can be Larry Williams, you know? And do you ever get like, do you ever get burnt out on it? And like, you're like, I just want to be Larry Williams. Yeah, 100%. I mean, look, to be honest, these days I've been feeling that way. Um, and a lot of that is to do with the hunger isn't what it used to be. Like when I was living with my mom in the Bronx, you know, in a not so safe neighborhood, I dealt with a lot of depression and anger and confusion and just not knowing where I was going to be in life <clears throat> or what to do for a living. Now that I have a lot of that figured out, at least with what I'm currently doing, you know, the hunger isn't the same. So, when I look at, okay, I got to take X y, and Z, X, Y, and Z to get here, to hit this next PR or to, you know, I have to win this, that, and the other show now. You know, after I feel like I've already done a lot in the square power thing, I've already built myself up doing PR for the last 10 years. And I'm like, hmm, like the drive isn't what it used to be, you know? And that worries me sometimes because, you know, you can see it in my videos now. I'm not like throwing my belt anymore, screaming after hitting lifts. You know, like, like the, like, I, I maybe it's just me maturing, but the aggression and the hunger isn't what it used to be. And it's, it's turned into something else, you know, it's turned into more like, how can I sustain this lifestyle and better it without doing what I've been doing? Right. Because I've been, I can't keep doing the same thing forever and expect different results. Right. If I keep relying on my strength and keep relying on hitting PRs, then nothing will ever change, you know? Um, and it's totally not sustainable. And um, yeah, like I'd love to be Larry Williams and keep on growing the way I am. So that's why I've taken that step to learning day trading because it's just, look, maybe I can never figure it out and it becomes too complicated for me or I don't succeed with it, but at least I'm taking a step in the right direction uh, because that's the kind of skill set that I would need to keep this lifestyle, keep growing. Um, and then, you know, there won't be any pressure to post for sponsors, for example. You know, I have like the post for several different sponsors now. 
meaning mainly have to make more videos than I would usually have to make. And they have to have good engagement. And there was definitely a lot of pressure, hundred percent, you know, hundred percent. And I do feel burned out from time to time. Um, but with that said, this lifestyle is very rewarding. I live a life of luxury and safety, um, you know, and, um, nothing uh, worth having is easy. Right. So like, I want to just find that balance where I don't have to compromise my health, but I can still live this lifestyle that I'm living and better it. You know, that's where I'm at mentally right now. Yeah. And I relate to what you're saying too, because the aggression goes, dude, like I, I can't be who I was in the basement. I can't, I, it's not there. The fire starts to burn out. The longer you get into it, where I think we both were at that point where it was almost like a desperation and, that's what drove us to like performing at that level. It was this like sense of desperation almost. And that created this fire, this chip on our shoulder. And now it's like, it's hard to be that way when you're, you're older, you're more mature. You realize there's more to life than PRs and all that and attention. And it's, it's tough because it starts to fade. And you, I, I tried to cling on to it for basically from like 27 to 30. I was like, or 27 to 29. I was like, well, maybe I can still hit PRs and stuff and push and, it just was never the same. Like I kept trying to figure it out. I'm like, why is this not the same? It was messing with me mentally. I couldn't, I couldn't get fired up like I used to. And it was such a struggle, but I had to let go at some point. It's like, it's, it's been good. Like, I just was like, I need to let go. I don't need to deadlift 900. Like it's okay. I've, I've come close. You know, I've come close in a meet. I don't need to do that. I, I never squatted 800. I came close. I never squatted it. And I was like, I'm at peace with it, you know. I, I'm at peace with the things I never accomplished. Absolutely, no, I respect that. I respect that. I respect that. Knowing when to draw the line, I think it's really important. And you definitely did that. Yeah, when to draw the line. You just get burnt out on like taking all the gear too and stuff. I'm like, I don't want, you know, I'm sick of cycling. I'm sick of all this crap. And like you, like I want to have a kid, so I, I, you know, I did come off. You don't necessarily have to come off. There's other ways to do it. With HCG and HMG, you can you can literally have a kid on TRT with HCG and HMG. It's possible. I've seen people do it. And I was on PEDs nine years straight, and I, I was completely tanked, and I still pulled it off. So your fertility, like I know you talked about that earlier, you're going to be fine. 100%. You'll be fine. Well, that's good to hear because by the time I'm 30, I want to be popping at least one or two kids. 100%. You'll, you'll make it happen. Just HCG, HMG, and then possibly Clomid. You might even need it if you just do a long HCG and HMG off and on every other day. Like your fertility is going to come back. You'll be good to go. So I wouldn't even be concerned about that at all. It's not that PEDs like make you infertile. Like people used to say, it's kind of a wife's tale. They do when you're on, you know, temporarily, but you can gain it back. It's just going to be a rougher road the longer you've been on. So it's, it's very possible. It took us like seven months. All right, then. Oh, like, yeah. I, know, I know buddies of mine who have, who were uh, one buddy of mine. He just got his wife pregnant and he was still on or he was just on HCG and HMG and HCG raises your test level to like you'll be at 2000 plus and you can have your fertility on that as well. So there's there's ways Oof. to go there. Yeah. Only one I know that has come I had kids on uh, gear has been out Thor. And again, similar to you, had a trap for about nine months or so. And then he pulled it off. Yeah, it's, it's definitely reasonable. Yeah, so you're 28 or 29 right now? Uh, 27. 27? Okay, you're still kind of young. No, but I understand. Like, this will hit you even harder. Like what we've talked about, it'll hit you even harder every year that goes by. You'll feel it more and more, and you'll be like, you're so successful. You're going to be okay. Like, I don't know. It's just one of those things that hits close to home because I understand on a, on a smaller scale, even from what you have been feeling. I feel that we can relate there because it gives me confidence that when that day comes, you know, not to keep beating a dead horse kind of a thing because I try and force it sometimes, but it's not the same. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't force that aggression that just isn't there. You know, it doesn't come from the same place. I think you're doing it right, though, and I think you, you know, you know what to do. And I like your, you know, you are prioritizing your health. You got all the, the heart stuff checked. You got the um, spacing <coughs> out on echocardiogram. You got the EKG, all that stuff. So that's cool. Like, uh, there's definitely more knowledge out there about being healthy too. And cause you know, and that's something like, obviously it's the, it's the obvious question that everybody has right now for, for everybody in the sport, whether it's powerlifting or bodybuilding, like how did the recent like bodybuilding deaths, how does that affect you? Like, how do you feel about that? Well, it makes you have to take your reality check, right. And assess your own health and your own goals and, you know, weigh the risk versus reward. Like 
is taking PEDs and abusing them worth what you can potentially gain from it? You know, like, what are your goals? Are you trying to miss your Olympia? Are you trying to break the all-time 501 record deadlift? Like, how far do you want to push it, you know? Um, because you can take testosterone at 500 mix a week and be totally fine, you know? Most chances are you're going to be fine, you know? But you could take five grams a week. You could take a pen of IU, a pen of growth a day. You can really push everything, you know, till there's no tomorrow and to your health is really seriously compromised. And um, in some cases, for some people, they do that, you know, because their goals are very, very high and they want the edge over their competitors. And it's just, again, like, is the reward worth the risk? You know, it's literally potentially dropping dead, you know, or needing a liver transplant, you know, your kidney failing, you know, like, is that worth it? You know, or you may be ending relationship. Like if you're on trend, you know, it's really hard to keep a girlfriend, you know, and not just a girlfriend, but, <laughs> you know, you're... <laughs> Your, your, your family, your close friends, like all that, all these people get affected. I mean, the last time I was on trend, I remember a close friend of mine here in Dubai, we had a short falling out because, you know, I was super irritable. You know, I saw everything in a really negative light. I thought he was out to get me, which was not the case. We made up now. We had a little lover quarrel. But uh, it's just like on trend, you know, like it can really ruin a relationship. So like there's a lot of, uh, and I just read a study on the, on, uh, the last thing to say about it how testosterone, you know, taking in a superficial way can shave off layers of your brain, which can make you more likely to get Alzheimer's and, uh, and dementia, you know, and on the long term. So, like, we don't really know what the long-term effects of abusing these drugs can really be. I mean, we see guys like Arnold and, and uh, you know, other bodybuilders from back in the day still okay today, but they were not using the same drugs that we're using today. You know, like, they were using different they were just on tests and some b-ball. They didn't have trend back then. You know, they didn't have, you know, they weren't taking 20, 30 IU of growth a day. You know, they weren't using it to like how we're using it today. So, you know, like what would be the long-term effects? You know, like what will we pay for later on from doing this, uh, you know, 20, 30? So, um, you know, when these bodybuilders are passing away, a lot of them I've met personally, shook hands with. It's just like surreal because they're so young, you know, 30, 40 years old. They still have so much life ahead of them, you know. They're leaving behind children and wives, and it's just, like, really sad, you know, because you and I can both relate to them, what they're doing, you know. They're passionate about fitness and taking PEDs, you know. And, you know, we share a lot of the same common interests, and we know what, what, what it's like for them because we've been through it or going through it ourselves. So it's like it hits, it hits home when uh, these guys pass away, which is why I took the – initiative to go and get my heart checked even though i didn't have any heart problems like you know my my uh, i didn't have any heart chest pain or anything in particular but um it was just like you said when you're on gear you don't want to get it checked out because you, you know it's going to be bad you know it's something you don't want to see right so you avoid going to the doctor and having it checked out because you know it's not going to be what you want to hear um but i did it anyway to check it out and um luckily i didn't abuse as much as i thought and Heart's a okay, you know, as well as all my other organs and my cholesterol and et cetera. You know, I get that checked out. I get my blood done regularly every quarter, uh, but my heart I've never checked out because I was too scared to know what the result would be. Um, so, you know, that's my that's my opinion on it. Well, I think too, like you said, you have kind of an exit plan. I think a lot of people just like need an exit plan because a lot of the deaths of the guys were in like their 30s and late 30s and 40s. So I feel like they were just in the game almost too long. And, um, Similar to you, like I, I had some of my my um, organs looked at and there was no enlargement. So it almost makes me wonder if it's more like the GH and insulin that that really blows the organs up. Because we saw that with Dallas, Dallas McCarver, and I used to train around him at two different gyms. So he was the same age as me and it really just kind of hit home. I was like, wow, this is probably, uh, I need to rethink this. So, Yeah, and uh, I've never used growth at more than like eight IU a day for three, four months. It would only be after I've gotten injured as well. So I wasn't using it to get bigger or get stronger. Um, it was solely for injury recovery purposes, you know. Um, so taking it as a bodybuilder would, you know, they would take, I've heard, up to 30 IU a day. I mean, imagine that, 30 IU a day for two to three years straight, I've heard in some cases. And that's just like, I mean, if I was doing the same thing, if I was doing that, if I was doing the, Growth hormone dosing, as I've heard some of these bodybuilders are doing, and uh, even the other sports, some arm wrestlers I've heard doing, some strongmen I've heard doing, 
you know, like my organs would definitely be enlarged, you know, at that kind of dose, you know, um, the side effects become severe, you know? So I think, I mean, look, you could take too much caffeine, you could drink too much water, too much of anything is no good. And if you're going to abuse it to that extent, like it's only to be expected that, um, uh, you're going to say face serious side effects, but, um, you know, with, with traditional anabolics, uh, I think the issue is that if you abuse it, if you push it too hard, that the side effects become unbearable. You know, you can't push trend at a thousand megs a week for a year or two straight. Like you just can't do that. After six weeks, like you're feeling so shit, your mood's totally fucked. You know, you, you can't sleep. You have your COVID and zits. Like you just can't keep it going much longer. So you inevitably come, come off within a couple of months, you know, whether you want to or not, just the sides are unbearable for most of us. So you can only abuse but so much. But with growth, you know, the sides are more subtle. I mean, you can't feel your organs growing, you know, and not everyone gets that carpal tunnel that people will hear about. Like not every, like I never get it, you know, um, but Adam, my videographer, he just has shoulder surgery and, you know, he's using it to recover quickly and he gets it, but we're taking the same dose, you know, right? So like you, you, this, the growth hormone side effects are so subtle that, you know, you may not get any at all, but it can be doing serious damage to your organs, right? So you can stay on and keep abusing it for, in that, in like for, for years and not even know what's happening to your body. Well, doesn't growth and insulin, they don't have that much of an effect on strength, do they? It's more like size, isn't it? That's what I've heard. Like growth doesn't really do much for strength. Insulin doesn't do much for strength. It's more size. That, that's why it helps yeah. the bodybuilders. Exactly. It's mostly just for size. I mean, you know, um, it's mostly just for size. 100%. 100%. The insulin, on the other hand, though... You know, you could take insulin and, uh, you know, four or six IU a day of growth and the insulin will make you just take down so much food that that's going to inevitably make you stronger. You know, if you're putting on five, 10 kg in a month, right, that you uh, wouldn't otherwise, <coughs> regardless of what antibiotics you're taking, that you're getting it strong just from the calorie surplus. Um, but uh, growth on its own, you know, it's not going to make you any stronger. That's what I've seen. Now, do you take any like prescription medication, like blood pressure meds, uh, statin for cholesterol, anything like that? No, because all my levels are A-OK. -okay. Like I don't have uh, anything in the red where I've been prescribed meds like that. So I just take natural supplements. Yeah, I know. I know you got some good natural ones and there's a lot of them out there. Do, do you know what your like LDL was? Like, I don't know. Uh, off the top of my head, no, I have to pull up the report, you know, I have to pull up the report to find that. Yeah, I've, you yeah. know what's interesting? Like, since I've been focusing more on health, even though I'm not on anything, I've like, have you ever done one of those like 23andMe checks to double your genetics? Uh, I have, yeah. Well, I, w I went into that. I did that. And then uh, Leo from Leo and Longevity, he like gave me a whole big thing to go through as far as like certain, uh, he basically checks certain genes as far as your cardiovascular risk and health. And I went through that. And like, I have tons of bad genes for uh, heart attacks and all that stroke, all that stuff. So even though I'm not on, I've been taking like an ARB for blood pressure, Telmasartan, 80 milligrams a day. And then I've been taking just for cholesterol, uh, Resuvastatin, which is Crestor. I take it twice a week. So the cool thing about statins, you can take them literally one to two days a week, the lower your LDL by 20, 25%, and you won't have any side effects. So you don't even have to take them every day. I've taken 10 milligrams Resuvastatin. No side effects. I feel nothing. My LDL, I got it down to 70, 70 LDL with, uh, with resuvastatin once a week and azetamide. So there's kind of some things out there that can like really lower your LDL, no, no effect on performance. Because there are other ones like Lipitor, which is atorvastatin, it'll, it'll make you feel like crap. And you don't have to take them every day and you can literally have good, good benefits. And like the ARB, Telmasartan, 80 milligrams, max dose, I feel nothing, like no negative sides at all. So and I get those off uh, All Day Chemist. Like, I don't even, you don't even have to go to a doctor necessarily. You can order them from All Day Chemist and really good stuff to keep that, keep the health in line. So that's always an option. Like, if you don't want to go to a doctor, because I know doctors are a pain sometimes, and they kind of like, you know, I ask you a million questions, give you the runaround. That's some cool stuff you can do. You can just, you know, you can get that. So it's always an option, like if you want to take your health game to the next level, because just even being on cycle, like your blood pressure, I feel like it's going to go up. So if you like got an ARB, you'd be better off even like tell Sartan, bro, I promise you won't feel anything. It won't affect your performance at all. Because I, I just, if you're going to like do, if you're going to push for like strongman and all that, like even if you just took it while on cycle, like taking Telmasartan, 
which is ARB is the, it's the most new class of blood pressure medication. That'll, that'll help a lot. Like you'll be healthier for that. And then if, I don't know if you're LDL, what it is, but like when you go look at it, if it's like over a hundred, you could bring it down even to like 70 ideally. And you could do that with, um, resuvastatin once or even twice a week, and you won't have any negative side effects. You don't have to take it every day. Like I do Monday, Friday, 10 megs and keeps my, keeps my LDL down. And that kind of helps regulate you know, health and, and all that prevents heart attack risk and all that sort of thing. So those are just two things I would look at. Like, you don't even have to say anything, like as far as what your levels are, you look at them, tell me over Instagram DM or whatever, we can dial some things in even better. Cause I did just to ensure you're even healthier, you know, uh, I'm on the same page there for sure. Cause yeah, I just cause know like, any- bro, the heavier you get and being on cycle, like your blood pressure goes up, you know? So. Yeah, no, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Me being on like two eighty five right now, so for sure it's elevated. Well, I'll, so. I'll I'll freaking DM you and we can because bro, just get them off all day cameras. Like we can set this. You won't I, listen. I promise you, you won't oh, feel okay. nothing. Like okay, okay. Just to help okay, you I'm out, dude, I'm just trying to. I know you're like <laughs> serious about living longer. No, I hundred percent. Yeah, we're on the same page there. So I'll DM you after this, and uh, I get the names and I'll order them from all day cameras. Uh, yeah, it's it's easy enough. It's cheap. It's whatever. Now, I don't know if you want to, you know, I don't want to like talk about anything you don't want to talk about. But like, it was Black Tom Cruise? He was your best friend, Otis Perkins. Um, how did how did that hit you? Like, is are you has anything been the same since? Like, uh, well, Black Tom Cruise is very unique, at least in my life, because. I've never met anyone with that kind of charisma that he had. And unless you've met him, I think you've met him maybe. Maybe you haven't. Um, but yeah. he always left him. You met him? I think I met him at one of the meets. I, I don't know if he ever – I'm trying to remember. Or the Arnold. I met him one time. I know this. I've seen him. And, you know, he always left a lasting impression on everyone he ever met. And uh, someone like him I felt was very special at that. I was frustrated almost that uh, his potential – um, was never fully realized because he could really make people laugh like they never laughed before. You know, everyone who's met him and had time to sit down with him for five minutes always thought that he was the funniest person they've ever met. And I just always saw him like doing stand up, being an actor or something like really big because he just brought so much charisma and energy and was so positive more than anyone ever met. And I always felt like, wow, like that was just so much wasted, you know, so much wasted potential there. And like it was never realized. And he never had the opportunity to do that. Right. And I felt like that it wasn't right. Um, but of course he was super young, like 37, 38, passed away super young, you know. Um, and yeah, it's he he lives on in our memories and our hearts, and you know, his videos are like eternalized on the internet, which I think is the beauty about the internet. Like you can pull up a black Tom Cruise video any time of day and you can see him cracking his jokes again and lifting and like he never left, right? So there's that aspect of it that makes it easier to move on, but uh, as far as like who he was as a person, you know, like he was truly a special person that, you know, I think I thought was definitely gone too soon. And uh, yeah, like uh, it's surreal because he's the only one that's close to me that has passed away. So it was my first time dealing with a serious loss, at least so, a loss that of someone that was really close to me. You know, um, I've had distant family members pass and, you know, I didn't know them very well. So, you know, it's sad, but you don't dwell on it. Right. Because you didn't really know them. Like, so, but him, again, we spent a lot of time together and we came up together. So it was, uh, it was very, very surreal, very strange that that actually happened. And it's, every, some days I forget that he passed away, to be honest. I'm like, oh, let me message him. Like, oh, wait. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. like, <laughs> you know. No, I get it. Because the other thing, I, I talked to him, did like a podcast with him in 2020 during the pandemic. And uh, Chris Hickson in December passed away. And that was like. Wait, Chris. Yeah, bro, Hickson you didn't know Chris? that? How did I not know that? Bro, oh, bro, God. Chris <laughs> Hickson, 29 in December, passed away. Like, oh my God. Yeah, dude. yeah. So he was one of the OGs. Like, when I was training with him in the Lily Bridges, like, we were all, you know, competing, co- competing with each other and doing the same thing. And, like, I uh I know he like went to prison for for dealing PEDs and he talked with us about all that and he was he was like his life was more on track and he was uh he sounded like he was doing well this was in 2020 so it was 2021 December 2021 last year 
that he passed away like mid December and it, no one really talked about it too much. Like, I'm, I don't know if people forgot about him or what, but it was like, that was crazy to me. Cause we were uh, pretty much the same age and we kind of came up in the sport together. So that kind of sucked, but. But how did he pass? I had no clue. How did this fire? Number? Well, I, it's, you know, like, it's um, unclear, but. Oh, I don't know. There, there was different things. Like you can look at the comments on that video I made right after he passed. And, um, it, I was talking, like I was talking about, cause no one made a video about it. And I'm like, someone should kind of commemorate him. And people said different things. I don't know. So it's, it's a little unclear, but it, the video is from December or something. You can see it. I will do. Um, wow. And I stopped watching his content mostly cause he was got, a, he got put away pushing PDs, right? But so during that time, I figured he was just in prison and he wasn't, you know, acting social media. There's nothing to see there. Before that happened, every once in a blue moon, I check up on him, see what he's posting, see what he's doing. Because like you like you said, it would feel like you, Eric, and him about to be watching when I was coming up. So, wow, that's, uh, that's super sad. Well, the other one too, like I know he was critical of you at one point, but he was critical of literally everyone in the world. So, Boston? Boston Lloyd? Uh, yeah. He, right, yeah. Because he, uh, I know he had a lot of enemies because he was very like <laughs> vocal and such, but he, uh, he passed away in February. And like, it was weird because I had texted him like the day before, like I was texting him 12 hours before. And, um, I never met him actually, but we, we talked quite a bit the last few months preceding his death and such, and, um, did podcasts together and all that. So it was kind of like, that was, uh, that was one, I know he was had the kidney issues, but it was still like really out of the blue. Like, we knew he had kidney issues, obviously, and he was very open about it. But it just uh, – no one expected, like, just out of nowhere for him to pass away like that. So that was pretty tough, too, because he was also 30, and it's like people your age start start passing away. It really hits you because he also had, like, a family and a, a kid and everything. So yeah, like On that level, we can relate because it's like, oh, shit, we're the same age. What if it was me? You can't, you can't help but feel like, what if it was me? Like, we're the same age, right? Bro, yeah, that's, that's how sudden. it was with Dallas. Dallas was 26. Dallas McCarver wow. was 20. I, I trained at the same gym as him in Kentucky and in Tennessee. Like, when we were in Tennessee, he was training at the, at the same gym. <laughs> so I saw him all the time. He was, like, pushing for the 900-pound deadlift right when I was. And so I was like, man, the guy's 26. What the heck, you know? So. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, it's, it's crazy yeah. the last couple of years. It is. It really is. Let me let me go through just a couple to finish up here, a little couple Q and A. Um, so one of the questions: Do you have any hobbies besides training and like your business? Uh, that he says, do you have any anything? Do you do anything that us mortals do in your time off? Yeah, uh, I throw my control at the TV after playing three hours of Elden Ring, like just about every day. Hooked on Elden Ring, love Elden Ring. Um, <laughs> I'm not much of a gamer, but every now and then a game comes out that I just get addicted to, I get hooked on, and as of late, it's been Elden Ring, you know, so I'm a bit sad that I'm, I'm on, like, a new game two or three already. I played so much of it, um, but besides that, going out to eat, nice restaurants, cinema, you know, standard stuff. Uh, I do have, you know, a good amount of free time, so I try to show those things I enjoy, uh, but, um, you know, no hobby that's particularly unusual. That's all standard stuff, to be honest. What's your favorite, like, I got to ask, what's your favorite snack? Like, because here in America, we got, like, way different weirds. I, you probably don't have that kind of stuff in Dubai, but, like, there's some pizzas here that are just freaking amazing. Um, we got, like, these new sour Twizzler things that are pretty good, sour-filled tropical Twizzlers. They're, like, these tropical Twizzlers, guava, like, those are pretty good lately. I've been on a kick with those because I still like to eat some like junk food, even though I'm not like I'm trying to be healthier, but I'm like, I still like some food. You know, I, I can't lie. Do you have like a favorite snack or anything? Yeah, I try not to keep snacks in the house because I'll eat them and nothing else is just snacks in the house. I don't have the discipline when I'm hungry to not go in the cabinet and grab some key chocolate fudge cookies if they're sitting in the cabinet. That is definitely my go to. It's always been my favorite, like Keebler. Chocolate fudge striped cookies. Like, those are the best things ever. Uh, besides that, uh, like, nothing else comes to mind. I love apple pie, you know, so any shape of apple, apple crumble, apple pie with ice cream, 
Uh, I love lava cake too. Like lava cake with some ice cream, you know, like that's the good stuff. Like that's something that gets me going, you know, like I'll, I'll, I'll have an apple pie or like a lava cake, you know, or a Keebler fudge stripe cookie any day of the week. I'm always down. Never gets old. You guys also, get like, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, and the last one being fruity pebbles. Like you can't beat the classics. It's just so crunchy and fruity. Like there's no better cereal than fruity pebbles. But yeah, that's, that's it for me. Can you guys get like fried chicken with gravy over there? <laughs> oh no, there's no southern food out here. No, there's no southern food. There's no Spanish food. Like you can't just get some good chicken and rice and beans. Like you can't get good pizza. People argue me here all the time. Like, oh, like try this pizza. I'm like, no, it's garbage. Like it's all garbage pizza. Yeah, I'm sorry. I love Dubai, but no one does pizza like the U.S. Particularly New York. Chicago, you know, like that's good pizza. I've even been to Italy, and the pizza there is not as good as New York pizza. <laughs> wow. So I have the total pizza snob. Like, if it's not like crispy and browned a little bit, like it, it's just not the same out here, man. I miss, I miss New York pizza. I miss it. Can you guys get like uh, Kraft macaroni and cheese out there? <laughs> uh, we get Kraft. We get Velveeta. My oh, personal you do? favorite. Okay. Get Velveeta. I mean, look, I grew up on microwave and microwave junk food and box food, and I think a lot of the time it just hits better than anything else. Like, it's, yeah. just, it's so easy to make. Like, just in the Velveeta, just add some water and like you're good to go. Like, you have like a thousand calories of mac and cheese deliciousness. You know, you get some craft mac and cheese through some hot water. Like, it's just so easy, so tasty. Bro, do you <laughs> see? I take craft macaroni and cheese and I add extra cheese. Like, I'll cut off a chunk <laughs> of cheese and like butter. It's so much better. Then you get like the Oh man, I'm dying here. No, but like fried chicken too. Like, do you have you even you have to have eaten a Cracker Barrel at some point, right? No, Cracker Barrel. You, wait, 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 wait. You haven't been to a Cracker Barrel in the U.S. I haven't even heard of it. It sounds familiar, oh, but bro, what do we got to do to get you to eat at a Cracker Barrel? Like, it's the greatest restaurant in in America. It's freaking amazing. Is it fried chicken specialty? It's like it's like it's like a old school homey environment, and they got like fried chicken with gravy, mashed potatoes, all the dumplings, all the southern food, biscuits, biscuits and gravy, uh, everything, fried okra, whatever you want. Like it's the go to restaurant, dude. Yeah, I've been missing out because it's all like, on the top of my food list. I mean, uh, there's nothing here that really specializes in fried chicken. It's all you get fried chicken here, of course, but. Okay. Nothing here that will give you that Southern American food taste. Nothing even close. It's like a stretch to find good mashed potatoes here, let alone like some good fried chicken and gravy. <laughs> it's a stretch. Man, all right. We'll, we'll get you to the U.S. back, and we got to try Cracker Barrel somewhere. I got another good question here. So out of all the people you've met, who is the strongest person like you've trained with or the, the person who impressed you the most? Like you've trained with a million people. Who was the one where you're like, this guy is either, it doesn't even have to be the strongest. Who was like the craziest? The crazy. Okay. Well, the most impressive individual, Hannah Sound, goes to Thor. There's just something about how big he is that you can never get used to. I was with him training for two months straight, and I would just constantly be breaking my neck to look at him in his eyes, you know, to make eye contact because he's just that tall. He is that wide. He's walking around at 440. I mean, before I left, he got up to 450, and it's just a behemoth. I mean, he did uh, 476 kg, so 1,076 pound deadlift in front of me. There were like 15 of his family and friends watching, and like the atmosphere that he would always bring to the gym when he walked in, like something special. Like, you know, being able to train with him at his strongest, at his biggest was something really special. You know, that was a real privilege for me. That was, like, really cool. Um, uh, was he the craziest? The craziest would be NDO champ. I mean, the lung capacity in this guy. He could scream for hours on it. I'm like, bro, breathe. He doesn't need to breathe. He'll scream for, like, 60 seconds straight and then go do a set of 20, you know, like, uninterrupted. Like, his energy is, like, unreal. No one has energy like NDO champ. You know, like, it's unmatched. I've never seen someone be able to have that much energy for like two hours straight. He does not have a chill mode, you know? It's like, and he's like nine kids on top of it. Like, dude, like you have nine kids and this much energy? Like where, how, 
Like, yeah. Let's dissect you. You know, we, we got to figure out what makes you tick because <laughs> not only you have like nine kids, you take care of all of them, but you bring this kind of energy to the gym and you work like three jobs. Like what? <laughs> he is a machine, you know? So those two people are just like the most like, uh, uh, the people that have like really strong impressions on me. Yeah, no, I, I, we've been around some crazy people over the years. What, what's <laughs> like bad. the craziest or what's, what's, let me see here. What was like your cycle when you were like 19 starting out? Like when you totaled like 1960? Yeah, I mean, at that time, I'm thinking, have I used trend that early yet? I'm not sure if I was using trend that early on, but uh, it would be usually like, you know, under a gram of test, like 500 to 750, and then I would use um, Anadrol. Uh, I would mix in Anadrol. I was, uh, I would mix in, uh, Deca as well at that time. I was really experimenting with what drugs I can react the best to, uh, take the least of, get the least sides. Um, but at that time, you know, health wasn't really concerned at all. I was so young. I was yeah, like, oh, I'll be fine. You know, like, you know, like, you don't you don't worry that much at that age, right? You think, like, yeah, I'll be fine. So, but I was really heavy into Anadrol back then. I remember I swore by Anadrol. Um, never pushed tests too much. Never pushed. Deca too much, never push the trend too much, but I would push Anadrol a lot. I remember I went for like 200 mix a day uh, for like six weeks straight, you know, just to see what I, what I could do on it. It was like, okay, let's see what happens. Um, I didn't drop dead, so that was cool. Hit some cool PRs, you know. Uh, Anadrol, I thought my maybe just really, really explosive. I never put up much weight from it either, uh, which helped me stay in the lower weight class, like 110 and, and, uh, and then 125 kg weight class and be underweight even, you know, because it never, never gained weight from it because I couldn't eat on orals. Um, I'd always have, I mentioned it in my first PD video, how I felt like I had uh, like rodents running around in my stomach, like eating away in my stomach lining. That's what it felt like. I had like this infl uh, this constantly inflated stomach. It was really painful, uncomfortable, this dull toothache like pain in my stomach. That made me really uncomfortable, number one. It was painful, and I had no appetite. But I was still super strong because that's just what Danadrol does. Uh, so, I, yeah, I creeped up a lot with the orals at that time. And, you know, I would get pains, like, you know, on my lower left side, my back, like where my, you know, uh, like, uh, I get pain, like, where my kidneys and liver is. Like, there's, like, these dull aches. Like, eh, it's fine. Like, I wouldn't even go get my blood tested or like go to the doctor, see what's wrong. I just assumed everything was going to be fine, you know. And that just shows like how dumb I was back then. And I got away with it. Um, still got away with it. Would never recommend it, of course. Never recommend it because um, if it was anyone else, who knows? Like it could have been like I could have been like a week or two away from like liver kidney failure. You know, I don't know how bad it really got. Cause I never checked it out. I never got my bloods checked at that time, right? So I don't know how bad it really was. But I remember pushing it quite a bit with the orals. Uh, but with the injectables, I never pushed too much because I didn't like injecting every day. or yeah. um, And I felt the orals, you know, you just get much faster gains. You know, they hit so much faster. Injectables take several weeks to build up in your system and for you to really feel a significant difference. So the orals is always my go-to, like, between, like, 18 and uh, like 21, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, it's crazy because I was kind of a non-responder to Anadrol, but... I would make better progress and feel way more explosive on 50 milligrams Anavar than 150 milligrams Anadrol. Like, I know it's crazy, but I, that's how much I loved Anavar. And I took Halo once, like when I was going for 904 and a meet, I got it to my knees, couldn't finish it. But the lead up to that, I bumped it up to 40 migs a day of Halo. I was so nauseous that if I would try to sit up, I would literally feel like I'm going to throw up. Just I would have to lay down all the time because if I sat up, I was I was so there was so much liver toxicity at that dose, which I know it's crazy. I understand that now. It was 20 milligrams morning, 20 evening, and I would there was the liver toxicity was so bad. If I stood up, I was just like I'm going to puke. I never puked, but I felt like it, and I couldn't eat anything. And it was the same kind of thing. I almost just was like I need to stop this. Um, so I've done some crazy stuff too, but you know you're you're younger and you don't know any better, and we live and learn, but. Halo is what did it for me. That same kind of feeling where I just was like, what am I doing? <laughs> I've tried Halo and I think the Halo I've always gotten has been fake Halo because I never noticed any difference in my mood, aggression, strength. It's always been, I think, fake Halo or I was seriously underdosed. Only one time I took Halo out of like maybe three or four attempts uh, did I really feel a significant change in my aggression, which is what it was. I was taking it for, right? 
to have that fearlessness, you know, when you go into hit the PR, like, you know, that no fear, like, oh, I don't care if I get hurt or not. I don't care if I get it or not. Like, I'm attacking this. I'm getting this weight up. Um, like, I never only felt that one time that I've taken it out of the three or four times I've taken it. Um, so, likely the other few times was not real Halo, you know. Yeah, I think I'm the same way. Like, Halo just hasn't affected it, you know, affected me that strongly. But I did have the liver toxicity that one time that just was like, ugh. So, yeah, okay, so let me see here. Where do you see yourself in 10 years then? What's, that's a good question. Like major life goals within 10 years. Oh, that's so far. Ahead. Look, <laughs> man, I take it, year, you know, I, I take it year by year because you don't know who you're going to meet, you know, and maybe it's not the answer he wants to hear, but you don't know who you're going to meet, you know, each day that you, you move on and, what opportunities that were presented before you. So to say that I'll be here in 10 years, you know, it's really just thinking too far ahead because, you know, plans change. Like things don't always go to plan. Like I have plans on like right at this very moment that I'm successful with my day trading and forex trading. I develop that skill. You know, I make my exit from the spotlight and the fitness scene in the next three years. So I'm 30, I have a kid or two, you know, from 30 to 40, you know, I'm being smart with my money, you know, and then further developing my skill of trading. And, you know, th like that seems like a good idea right now. But uh, again, like you meet people and opportunities and everything just changes so fast that I don't ever think that far ahead. You know, like if you would have asked me where I would be 10 years ago when I was 17, that same question, where I would be in 10 years, like there's no way I thought I'd be here in 10 years. Like it's just, just so much has happened in that time frame that, you know, every year just significant changes happen. I meet so many different people and so many different opportunities. Like every, you know, few weeks, I feel like here in Dubai, people want to do business with me and they're like, you know, let's try this or join me and partner with that. And it's, it can be overwhelming sometimes. Like, okay, what is the right decision? You know, what is worth my time and my money? You know, where should it go? Where should I go? Is Dubai where I want to stay? Like, you know, like as much as I have things figured out, like there's still so much uncertainty you know, in my life, like where I'm going to be in the next two years, let alone five or 10 years. Um, and I, while I do think it's good to plan ahead, I think it's just more important to have a vision, you know, and like my vision is, as I mentioned before, like 30 out the spotlight, good at trading, you know, um, I have maybe a franchise of gyms, you know, like this, this is all like optimal, ideal, best case situation. Um, but unless everything plays out exactly as I want it to, which, you know, may or may not happen. Like I just take it like day by day, year by year. And I and go with the opportunities. Yeah. I get that too. Cause like I couldn't have pictured myself same thing 10 years ago. And I've heard like a thing every seven years, you kind of morph into a new person as far as what you're doing, your, you know, how your life is and your personality. So it's really hard to say, but then I got one last question, and then I'll let you go. Like, what were your best numbers when you were natural, if you can recall? Uh, as far as I can remember, a long time ago. Uh, probably, uh, I guess, 16, the last time I was fully natty. I remember going to the gym. A couple of guys were trying to teach me how to deadlift. It was, I guess, like 365. I did 365 for maybe one or three reps or something like that. Uh, my first bench, I remember, uh, not my first bench, but my best natty bench was somewhere around, I want to say, like, 340, 350. <clears throat> and my best squat, I don't count because it was always a quarter squat when I was natty. I was always squatting, like, at best, halfway down. It was all eagle lifting, all the knees. Um, I laughed when I look at those videos from back then. And I was throwing up, like, four plates, four or five. But again, it was like a quarter squat, you know, half squat at best. So, and that was, that would be for like three to five reps, something like that. Yeah, no shame in that. We all start somewhere. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I think, I'll think I'll wrap it up there. We've been like an hour and a half. I don't want to make it too long. And yeah, man, no, I appreciate you coming on because it was fun, like catching up with you. And like there, I learned a lot about you even on this because I've seen your stuff. I know a lot about you, but. Like, it's kind of cool to see your vision and find out what you're doing outside of, like, lifting and all that. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, we've related in more areas than I thought. Like, it's, like, a bit motivation for me that, 
you can do what I'm trying to do in the next few years. Like basically when I'm your age, <laughs> yeah. you, PD and, you know, not be so reliant on hitting PRs and, you know, being in the spotlight, you know, like getting ahead of the game and being ahead of the curve. Yeah. Yeah. I think you'll be good. Cause I mean, and I aspire like your business sense is very impressive. Honestly, the last few years, the way you've grown things and what you've done. So, you know, your motivation for me as well. And you've always been with your lifts. They're just insane. Like I can't fathom the numbers you've put up. You're the most popular power lifter of all time. You've, you've done things that are just absurd. So you kind of open the door for like some of these other freaky guys who came along and just, it's, uh, it's crazy how, how the sport's grown and all the things you've done for it. Look, it's been my pleasure. And I met so many incredible people on the way, you being one of them. And, uh, you know, I can't wait till next time we catch up. If you're ever in Dubai, we're well, in Tennessee, vice versa. You know, we let each other know. We'll make it happen. We'll, we'll link up for sure in person. Yes, sir. Yeah, I appreciate it, buddy. I'll uh, I'll send you a DM then, too, and I'll we'll be in contact, okay? Hell yeah, man. All right. All the best to you. Yep, you too, brother. I'll see you. All right, then. Take care.